Number two, we fear because we doubt. We fear because we doubt. Let's pick up the story again. Now God calls Gideon to much bigger things. See, God never lets us rest in the victories of yesterday. The destroyer of the Baal idols is now called to raise an army and drive the invaders out of Israel for good. In Judges 6, verse 36, he reminds God, he says, If you will save Israel by my hand like you promised... And now God gives him a new name, which literally in Hebrew means, you will save by my hand. See, there's no end to the awesome names that God gives his people. God has called us to be nothing less than his hand of salvation to this world. But notice how Gideon starts out in verse 36. If, if you will save Israel by my hand like you promised. How do you begin a sentence with to God with the word if and end it with the words like you promised? In an instant, this mighty man of valor becomes a tree cutter again. He doubts himself and he doubts his God. See, it's so easy for us to revert back to our old selves again. And now he does a terrible thing. He actually puts God to the test. Gideon puts a fleece or a rug out on the floor, and he says to God, he says, God, if in the morning there is dew on the fleece and the ground is dry, then I'll trust you. So God does it. He does exactly what what Gideon says, but that's not enough for doubting Gideon. Now he reverses the test. He says, tomorrow morning, if there's dew on the ground, but the rug, the fleece is dry, then I'll believe you. See, this idea of fleecing God or testing God has become part of our Christian jargon. In short, you're asking God to give you a sign before you'll take action. Can I encourage you? Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't fleece God. Fleecing God or putting a fleece before God needs to be banned from our vocabulary. Faith doesn't need a sign. Faith operates on the promise of God. What Gideon did was a pagan practice. This is the way that Baal worshippers determined whether or not their gods would be with them in battle. See how quickly we begin to think like the people around us. How quick we are to turn back to our old worldly ways. And when we least expect it, the mighty man of God relapses to Gideon, the tree cutter, idol maker. See, doubt is an idolatry because it turns God's promises into ifs, buts, and maybes. God promised, I will deliver this people through you. And Gideon quickly forgets and says, how do I know? Here's how you know. Because God promised. Because God said it. Because God never screws up because God never messes up. If he promised, it will come to fruition. If he has promised, you don't have to doubt it. If you can take him to the bank because he is 100% accurate all the time. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. See, Gideon learned to see the dew on the fleece one day and the fleece dry the next day. He needed signs and wonders and miracles to believe, and there's nothing wrong with signs and miracles and wonders, but doubting Christians need to see the evidence that God is at work, but mighty men and women of valor act on the promises of God. They go simply because God said he will go before them. That's why Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith it is impossible to, to please God. Doubt only feeds the lion. Doubt only makes you forget and fear. We fear because we forget. We fear because we doubt. And number three, we fear because we boast. We fear because we boast. We pick up the story in Judges 7, The mighty man of valor has 
sent out the call to the people of Israel and trying to recruit people to fight the enemy. And 32,000 men show up to fight the Gideonites. It's a, quite a number of men. It's a huge army. But the reality is they were small. Judges 7.12 describes the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the Gideonites as people that were like, the valley was like locust in abundance. Their camels alone were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. 32,000 people is hardly enough to take on such a mega army. But here's what God says in Judges 7.2. He says, you've got too many people. You've got too many people. The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand, God says. Why? Because lest Israel will boast over me saying, I did this. Lest Israel would boast and say, my hand saved me. Too many men? You've got camel that are as countless as the sands on the seashore. And we've got 32,000 people. And God, you're saying we've got too many men? And God says, yes. Because if you trust in your own strength, you'll only feed the lion of fear. Show me the numbers is another version of show me the dew on the fleece. And so God reduces the number of people that are in the army till there are only 300 people that are remaining. 300 people to fight this mega army. There's no way that this mega army can win, that this 300 group of men could beat, this defeat this mega army unless, of course, God fills them with supernatural power. See, that's why St. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 2, he said, Jesus would say to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And here's Paul's response to it. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The mighty man of valor leads his 300 men down into the valley in the pitch dark of night. And I want you to notice the weapons that they carry. They don't have any. 300 men are going to go fight a mega army with no weapons. Here's what they carry. In one hand, they have a trumpet, more likely a ram's horn. In the other hand, each of them is carrying a clay jar filled with a little bit of light inside. That's all they're carrying. A musical instrument in one hand and a jar of clay so that they could see where they're going in the other hand. A jar of clay with a little light inside. You know, jars of clay have been picked, has been a picture of God's warriors in every age, in every decade, in every century. St. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 4, but we have this treasure, this treasure of God's presence, this treasure of God's power. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. Here's what happens. At just the right moment, the 300 men begin to blow their horns and they break their jars. See, jars of clay are so easily cracked. Jars of clay are easily broken. Jars of clay can easily be smashed to smithereens. And so can we. But because the jar has been broken... The light now shines even brighter. Can I suggest to you that this is why God has to break us sometimes? That if you're going through a hardship in life, it is God breaking you and molding you and cracking you so that the light inside of you could shine more brightly. You wonder where God is. God is working to break you so that his light can shine more brightly. That, the 300 begin to shout in verse 20. 
And they begin to make all this noise. And they shout, they say, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. And that's the call to Christians who are jars of clay. Go to the world and live your life so brightly, so strong, and shine for Jesus. Shout, let your light, life shout out for Jesus. <coughs> and then the Holy Spirit sends the enemy into a state of confusion. They begin to stramp, stampede all over each other, and they go back home defeated with their tails between their legs. Listen, God specializes in using human weakness to win great battles. You say, I don't have much. You say, I can't do much. You say, I'm broken. You say, my life is a mess. You say, it feels like my life is falling apart. You say, it feels like my life is shattered. And God says, now my light can shine through you. Now my light can be seen through you. God specializes in using human weakness to win great battles. He gathers 11 uneducated, outcast men, and he puts them on a hill and he tells them, go disciple the whole world. He sends 120 people back to Jerusalem and he tells them to go to the ends of the earth, but then he says, wait until you are full of the Holy Spirit. Clay jars, full of God's light. Clay jars full of the presence of God. Clay jars broken and cracked and messed up, but full of God. This morning, all of us in this room are broken. We have issues that we deal with, we're cracked, we have struggles. But can I suggest to you that we are the ones that God wants to use to love and reach our neighbors and our community? He's not looking for people who've got it all together. He's not looking for people who's figured it out, but he's looking for people that are broken, that says, God, I bring nothing to the table at all, but I come with cracks and wounds and hurts. Would you take my mess and would you use it so that I will boast in my weakness that the power does not come from me, but it comes from you? As a church, we are looking to reach our city this summer. We want to touch the lives of people in our community so that people could be blessed in a very tangible way where kids would get school supplies for the school year, and we could be a blessing for families. But beyond that, we want to bless them because through that, we want them to know that there is a God who loves them and cares for them. I'm going to ask the guys to pass out a little card where I want to challenge you this morning. Last year, as a church, we reached about 53 students and gave them school supplies for the school year. And about 30 of them came for VBS and we were able to share the gospel of Jesus with them. My prayer this year is that we would reach even more. My prayer this year is that we would be able to reach at least 75 to 100 students and bless them with school supplies, bless them with the love of Jesus, where they would see that there is a God who loves them. You have in your hands cards where I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, how are you calling me to bless our community this morning? You don't need to give this morning, but I want you to be praying. Over the next two months, we're collecting money so that we could buy school supplies and host a VBS for our neighborhood. Maybe you can bless one student. That's $30. Maybe you can bless one student this month and one student next month. That's $60.
maybe God has blessed you enough where you could easily bless five or ten students. Broken vessels, full of the light of God, that says, I'm going to feed my faith. I'm going to trust that the little I give can be used by God to change our city. That I can, might not have much, but I can bring this little that I bring and see God use it. So I'm going to invite you today to examine your hearts and say, God, you've called me to love this city. I might not be able to share the gospel with people, but I might be able to pray that people in our community would see Jesus. I might be able to sponsor one or two kids. Would you be obedient today? And would you give as God calls you to give? Like I said, you don't have to give today. But would you make a promise and say, hey, this is my promise before God, that I am going to trust God to give me the funds to be able to bless, whether it's one, two, three, five, ten, whatever God's calling you to give, would you be obedient to it? This is not just something that a few of us do. This is how we as a church can reach and love our city. So I'm going to take a moment, and I'm going to just invite you to examine your heart and examine, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And I, would you write your name down? Would you write the number of people God's calling you to sponsor? This will help us determine how many people we can bless this year. We're working on trying to get some sponsors that will match our funds so that we can host our VBS debt, debt free and we don't have to raise additional funds for that. We're working on some things to be able to do that. But we want you to be obedient to Jesus. This is your chance to feed your faith and to starve your fears. It's a chance for you to remember and declare boldly who God has called you to be. It's a golden opportunity to go beyond fleece examining doubt and act on the promises of God. It helps you give away some of the stuff that you have been hoarding for rainy day protection and to be reduced from 32,000 to 300 and see how God can work through broken jars of clay. Would you ask God to use what he has blessed you with and give for his glory to touch many lives? Would you allow God to stretch you and break you and ultimately use you for his glory? Take a second. And would you write that down? When the worship team sings today, we'll pass our offering buckets down. And you can drop that in there. And if you would, would you prayerfully consider sponsoring one or more? And as you do, you're helping us reach our city more effectively. Would you be obedient there? See, I wish I could tell you that Gideon's story ended well. I wish I could tell you that he lived his life with such faith that he was a mighty man of valor for his entire life. He did great feats. The 300 men drove away this mega army of Midianites and Gideonites. It was enough to get him into the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. But listen, if you like happy endings, don't read Judges 8 or 9. Because this mighty man of valor, he goes back home and eventually slides back to his old ways. He again becomes a tree cutter. And the last time we see him in Judges 9, what we see is that he carves out a bale pole. He decorates it with gold that he plundered from the Midianites. And he erects it outside of his house. The mighty man of valor that God used returns again to become an idol maker. The liberator of Israel becomes the one that is used to enslave it back to idolatry. See, the sad story doesn't even end with his death. In the last years of Gideon's life, he marries many women and he fathers 71 sons and who knows how many daughters. One of his sons 
is a child of a slave prostitute in another town. And after Gideon is buried, the prostitute's son, in a bid to seize his father's position, slaughters 69 of his half-brothers. This is the legacy of a man that was once known as a mighty man of valor, a man that was once known as the destroyer of Baal, the man who was once known as the hand of God's salvation. See, listen, if you stop going forward, you'll inevitably fall backward. If you stop pursuing Jesus with your life, you will allow the fears to consume you. You have to keep feeding faith or the lions of fear will rise again. I shared this a couple weeks ago, but since we became a church over the last several years, God has blessed us with the opportunity to give over $160,000 to global and local missions whether that's serving in the apartment communities or sending students on missions or actually sending a team from here to work in India or Trinidad or other parts of the world. $160,000 in this small group of people, that's a lot of money. We barely make that much in a year. We don't make that much in a year. And yet over the last five, six years, that's how much we gave just for the cause of advancing the gospel in our community. There's a lot that we could rejoice on in what God has done through us. See, this happened because you guys fed your faith and not your fears. Some of you dug deep into the reservoirs of your faith, and today you might be tempted to say, hey, today I can do less. I can rest on the past victories of my life. Listen, Gideon couldn't. Gideon couldn't. Neither can we. Neither can we. Because here's the reality. As long as there is one unreached person outside of the doors of this church, our mission is not done. As long as there is one person in this world that hasn't experienced the grace and love of Jesus, God is calling us to stretch our faith to win them for Jesus. I'm excited about this upcoming season of doing vacation Bible school and back to school drives and serve Sunday, of us not just simply sitting here and hearing God's word, but us intentionally going out and loving people that desperately need to hear Jesus. I'm excited that right now Claudia is in San Antonio serving Jesus for the next six weeks and reaching people for Jesus. I'm excited that Roman and Stephen are going to India for six weeks and loving on students, that Savannah is going to East Asia and loving on students, that God is going to use them for his glory. I'm excited that God is raising up Dylan to go to the campus of Baylor and be on staff there with InterVarsity and love the students on that campus. We have much to thank God for as a church. But the mission is not done. We cannot boast and rejoice in past victories. We cannot boast and rejoice in the things that God has done for us in the past. There are people that don't know Jesus. There are people that have never heard even once that God loves them. And we have been chosen by God jars of clay broken see the beauty of that jar of clay was there was a light that was inside of that jar and because that jar was broken the light began to shine some of you in this room this morning are wondering God when is the breaking going to stop when is this going to end and the Holy Spirit this morning is reminding you that it's going to happen until His light completely shines through your life. That your suffering, your pain, your hurts are not in vain. It's not 
meaningless, but that there's a God who has a purpose behind it. That he is using it for his glory. That your life is not simply about you, that you don't, it's not about your few days on earth and your happiness. It's about his glory, and as you pursue his glory, he says he'll take care of every other detail of your life. He will provide for you. He will take care of you. He will heal you. But ultimately, he wants to use you so that through you, he will shine and people will know that he is a good and loving God. Jars of clay, full of the Spirit of God. We could do much for God's glory and God's honor. Our Savior was perfect in every way. He lived a blameless life. If there was one that didn't need to be broken, it was Jesus. But he voluntarily went to the cross. He voluntarily took the beatings he voluntarily took the abuse. The scripture says that he was broken for us. He was broken and gave his life. And through his brokenness, today we sit as sons and daughters of Almighty God. Jesus being broken meant that you and I are now part of the family of God. Listen, you being broken, there's a purpose behind it. There's a plan behind it. God intends to use you for his glory. This morning as we come to the communion table, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections, your desires. And would you come to the table knowing, acknowledging the work that Jesus has done on your behalf? Would you come, partake of the table, forgiven and cleansed, belonging to the family of God? Let's worship God as we come to the table. Let's thank him for saving us, redeeming us. Let's thank him that he is still working in us. As the worship team sings, would you just spend some time with God? And whenever you are ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements from the table, and then we will partake of communion together. Let's worship.